Well, welcome, Steve, to the show, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I have to tell you, walking around this collection, it is amazing. It is just mind-blowing, all the stuff that you have collected over the years. And I found myself thinking, it's hard to believe that one person was able to collect all of this. So how did you go about that? Well, it's interesting. I, I've been around a long time as a collector, and uh, a lot of the things that are in this collection, I really have to give credit to other collectors for. I would focus on one category, like comic books was my first love. I would go aggressively and get every comic book I could find that I loved and that had before and ones I didn't have. But then uh, while I was doing that, other people were building collections in different categories that were comic related or were appropriately pop culture related. And so fortunately, as time passed on, I was able in many cases to go and buy those collections in their entirety from someone who might have spent 30 years of their life building that particular category. So. Um, in fairness, uh, a lot of this has been my blood, sweat, and tears, but also other people as well. And as you think about it, um, collectors, the word collector usually has been associated with some person who's like a freak in a sense because they, why do they do this? What drives them? What motivates them? And in reality, most people are collectors and just don't realize it. Uh, you go around your own house and some things you just can't bring yourself to throw out because they have an association with your life or your memory or your family and you get accustomed to it. And then there's things that are conducive to collecting. For example, if you don't even read the comic books, but let's say you suddenly found you had one through seven and nine through 12, mm -hmm. you'd want number eight. Right. Because it fills in the run. <laughs> and so people collect for sequ sequential purposes. Many of the comic collectors collect by special artists. If they like a certain artist, like a Frank Frazetta or whoever, they'll buy by artists. Some will buy by writers. Uh, some will buy for whatever reason or characters they follow. And it's, it's, and it's extended to all the associated material with it. Comic books are really experiencing a renaissance in the modern day. Uh, the most recent movie, The Avengers, is breaking Titanic's record for you know, box office sales. And what's really happened is, it's brought the kid out in all of us. We found that it's okay to read and watch things that are of a science fiction, fantastic nature. We've always had a fascination with that. It's just there was kind of a taboo. You were considered a nerd or a geek if you did things like that. And uh, quite frankly, some of the most prominent collectors I know are very famous people. Some are movie stars, some are doctors, some are lawyers, some are scientists. It would amaze you. And if I had to pick one occupation that predominates all the collectors that I've ever associated with, it's school teachers, hands down. I don't know why, it just is. <laughs> the museum itself is an educational journey or timeline through the history of the country, and really for that matter the world, through the eyes of pop culture with special consideration for the comic book characters. School kids come here and teachers, I told you already, teachers are the, the number one dominating <laughs> occupation I've found. And many of them were always remiss, or not remiss, but uh, uh, reluctant to use them in the classroom for fear they'd get in some kind of jackpot over it. Mm -hmm. The irony of which is, today it's widely accepted to use comics. Reading is about desire to read. You have to have interest first. It's Jack and Jill went up the hill may not turn you on. But Jack and Jill and the Hulk mud up the hill might get your attention. You know, so that's what, whatever it is, it's better. We've had, we did this program with third grade kids with, with the schools of Maryland. And when we had the little celebration here, when they're doing the next level in the sixth grade, you should see the endorsements. They told us this one little girl would never touch a book. Now they can't keep her away from comics. And it extended, it isn't a replacement. They you know, want to read the comics. When I was a kid, I remember my favorite comic at the time was Journey to the Center of the Earth, the classic comics. I loved the movie, I loved it. And you know what it made me want? I wanted to read the book. So it's a stimulant. Mm -hmm. What different changes have you seen in the industry in the years that you've been in? The, the years industry? that I've been, we've watched many different changes in distribution. That's really kind of why I'm around in this sense, because the distribution went from the historic or traditional method of magazine distribution, where you send them out to the stores, the, whatever they sell sells, whatever they don't sell they send back, they get returns. It was kind of a nuisance to the magazine dealers. The comics were low end, they were 10 cents, they didn't bother. All of a sudden, comic stores sprung up, and they not only had the comics sooner because they treated them with priority, but they kept them in mint condition. You could buy back issues, you know. And more importantly, the comic store was the clubhouse, <laughs> where you could talk to other people about your hobby. Every collector that came in my store in 1974 thought they were the only comic book collector in the world. Their parents thought they had three heads, they looked down upon them. And all the while, they loved this. So when they got to the store, it was great to get the comics, but boy, to hang out and talk. And that's what, that's what they are. They're really clubhouses. Okay. 
When did you open your first comic book store? 1974, July 1st. I quit the post office on June 30th after five years, and as I was going out the door, they said, see you in September. You're, you're going to make $50 a day doing this? I remember they gave me a routine like you wouldn't believe. Oh, boy, was that the funny ironic. Part is I loved that job. I hated to leave, but... I was doing conventions and I was making more money on the weekends at my job and the only way you can get off on the weekend at the post office is to have about 250 years seniority, mm -hmm. which I didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still go to Comic Cons, by the way? This week, I go to the biggest Comic Con there is, and it is now the biggest Hollywood show. It's called Comic Con in oh, San Diego. Yeah, there will be 150,000 people there. Movie stars everywhere you look. I'm, I'm sponsoring three different parties there this year. One of them's got Shaquille O'Neal as the after party for the Eisner Awards. Uh, I think Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio's father is going to be at this one. We're, we're honoring a guy who passed away that was the founding guy, one of the founding two guys at the San Diego Comic Con. His name was Richard Alf. And we're doing a real warm, fuzzy, nostalgic for the people that went to this one particular hotel room and everybody's coming. And Leo DiCaprio's father was evolved back then on some, some level. We're hoping Leo shows up because Leo actually has bought comics from me, in fact, on occasion. Ah. So uh, we're hoping that happens. But there'll be movie stars everywhere. It's just amazing. For me, distribution was an afterthought. You know, when I got into this, I was selling old collectible comics. We weren't even selling new comics, period. In fact, when we started carrying new comics, it was almost we went kicking and screaming to carry them because we had to have them to keep people coming back regularly because other stores were opening. We couldn't, if he had new comics across town and the kids came in every Wednesday to get them or whatever day it was at the time, you had to have a hook. And so you started begrudgingly carrying new comics, but they were a pain, you had to pay in advance two months, you had to get them in increments of 25. Everything about them was a nuisance, you couldn't return what you just didn't sell. So I was strictly retail at the time, one store, then I opened a second store, then I opened a third store, then I opened a fourth store, and I started to become a, a decent sized account for my little distributor. And then other stores would open and say, you know, I can't meet the minimums, and I'm not really close to you, we don't compete, could you let me tag my orders onto yours? Sure, no problem, help me out, me too. So I was like distributing under the auspices of Jeppy's Comic World and one thing led to another and then my distributor moved to Florida. He had about 10 accounts he wanted me to service. I had 16 accounts. I'm still doing this side part time. And then he had financial trouble. Next thing you know, I'm in the distribution world. I'm buying out his company and before you know it, I got a warehouse in Florida, one in Boston, one in Baltimore. And then I started to take it seriously and I started to grow the business through good service and acquisition. And it was in 1988, we had risen to the second largest distributor, and I bought out the third largest distributor, and we became the largest distributor of a position we've never relinquished. And now, due to the 1995 Marvel trying to buy a distributor and screwing the whole industry up, I became the 800 crown gorilla because DC Comics announced that they were going to go exclusive with one company. It was going to be either me or Capital City, and fortunately, we, we, we won that battle. And I later bought out Capital City when they valiantly hung on for a year uh, as a more of a niche distributor. And, uh, and when it happened, uh, we had a gentleman agreement and uh, I went down and serviced all the accounts and made sure no one, none of the publishers got stuck. The argument was you could just let them go out of business and you'll get all the business. Yes, but a lot of publishers would go by the wayside too because they weren't getting paid. So I'm happy to say not only these guys walked away their heads up and some money, but all the publishers got paid. You could live anywhere you wanted to live. So why do you stay in Baltimore? What is it about the Baltimore? City of the world. <laughs> I tell people, often been quoted, that DC is the capital of the United States, Annapolis is the capital of Maryland, and I live in Little Italy, which is the capital of Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> but what I like about it is when I have lunch now, I call somebody, I say, come down to Little Italy. It's very easy to talk people into doing that. <laughs> come to Little Italy, they come to me. Walk around the corner, it's like the old days, you run into all your buddies, you're waving, you're, how you doing, what's going on, and you kind of get back to your roots, and you, 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 you don't want to be Steve Jeppy, the other guy, you want to be Steve Jeppy, your buddy from the neighborhood, and they all accept me for that and treat me well, and I wouldn't give up. I've been to a lot of great things, I've been to the White House, but I wouldn't give up my bull roast in Dundalk for anything. Over the years, you have supported a number of charities. Why do you feel that's important? Well, at the risk of an overused term, it's, it's, it's a responsibility. Just like I said to you about the collection, sharing your collection, you know, letting other people see it. If you've been blessed or fortunate enough to have been successful in business, it's just, I don't know, it's a gene we have. Uh, everybody, I think, I'd like to think everybody feels that way. You feel like you want to share the, the wealth. There's no fun having a party by yourself. 
if you're a, all the money's coming to you and all the fame and everything and you just sitting in the corner looking at yourself that's a pretty lonely life I think it's more fun to be able to share and, and I've been touched by a lot of these charities different people my brother died of lung cancer has been a you know a number of different things that are very specific bottom line is I think giving there's two kinds of people in the world there are givers and there are takers I do not want to be a taker it's never been in my world my mother God bless her, may she rest in peace, she went to the third grade, but she was as smart as anybody I ever knew, gave me all my values, and I found that being a giver felt better. Do you, by the way, remember the first comic book you ever read? I certainly do. My favorite first comic book. I learned to read from Batman, but there's a comic, I must have 12 copies of it. It was an annual, I mean, at the time, at the time we called them thick comics, because it was 25 cents of an annual. It was Tubby and his clubhouse pals. <laughs> And I always fascinated the little boy in me wanted to have a clubhouse with all the guys. He had the sign that said, no girls allowed. And on the, on the cover, you got the ones on the roof and they're painting thing and the, and the paintbrush is coming down on Wilbur's face. I remember that comic like that. And inside, it, was, it turns out, in irony, I didn't know it, but one of the more popular secondary characters in the Tubby comic was Sammy the Martian. It was the first Sammy the Martian. <laughs> I love that comic. I could read that over and over and over again. And I would just go back to like 1959 in my mind and be sitting there and just loving life. So hundreds of years from now, when people are reading their history online or however they're reading it by then, how do you think you'll be remembered? Or how would you like to be remembered if it's different? Oh, I remember Cal Ripken answered this question once with a great answer. He said, just to be remembered at all is a good thing. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> that's, that's kind of pretty profound. To, Thank you, Cal. I'll try to not steal that from you. But, <laughs> That all being said, uh, I just, I'd like to be remembered as one of the guys, you know, who happened to be in the right place at the right time and had the right passion that was able to preserve something that needed to be preserved. You know, whether somebody else preserved it or me, it will be a great feeling, you know, to know now even that someday maybe somebody will walk into this museum or whatever might be directly related to my having existed and say, boy, I'm glad Steve was around to do that, had the passion to do that because all these other people can enjoy it. All right, well, thank you again so much for your time, Steve. We were really glad to talk to you today. And we will be right back. <laughs>